Trader, trade, trader, Cobb Crypto Podcast. Podcast. This is the Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TraderCobb Crypto Show. I have another amazing guest today. But before we do that, I just want to let you know that this is sponsored by TraderCobb.com. So jump across to the website, TraderCobb.com, where you can get all your crypto trading education needs. Plenty of free stuff there too, guys. So amazing guest today with uh, Niraj Muraka. And um, look, I'm really stoked to have him on board because, uh, look, he's the co-founder and the CTO of a project that I've been keeping an eye on for a little while and want to know more. Blue Zell. Now, some of you may have heard him speak uh, in different parts of the world. I know he was there at Consensus when I was there, and I have uh, read and looked and watched a great deal of content out there from this gentleman. So thank you so much for being on the show today, mate. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. D- really happy to be here. Excellent. Well, look, I guess the first thing to do uh, to touch on really is if you could just give us a little bit of an introduction on yourself and look really why Blue Zell has come about and um, you know how you got to this point that you are now, really. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, I started the company in uh, 2014 with my co-founder. We uh, we were based here in Vancouver, and we were originally interested in the problem of remittance. Basically, we observed that the Indo-Canadian community here in Canada had a problem. If they wanted to send money back home to India, it was expensive. You know, they had to resort to things like Western Union or wire transfers, both of which are not optimal. So we wanted to build a payment system using decentralized slash blockchain technologies. And we originally built our payment systems using Ripple, which most of us have heard of. Since then, we moved the company in 2016 to Singapore, and we've, we've changed the focus a fair bit. You know, we went into enterprise, we built KYC, which is Know Your Customer. We built an enterprise KYC product, which was using Ethereum. And that's when really the, you know, the big kind of light bulb went off that, you know, there wasn't really a decentralized database that was available that used the best of decentralized technology and was there, you know, for decentralized apps, but also for non-decentralized apps. And that's that's kind of what was the genesis where... Uh, we, we wrote the white paper and uh, began working on what is our biggest project right now, our Buzel database. And that's that's where we're at right now. And that's, my, that's generally my focus day to day. Okay. And I mean, look, effectively, just to sort of crunch that a little bit, you're, you're basically a, a data sharing company based on, sorry, a decentralized data sharing company. And so, so that people can make sense of that, what that effectively is, is right now we've got our data sharing, which is in the cloud. Now, the cloud is owned by corporations. It's so I think we'll... We spoke just before this, Niraj, about um, the cloud and how it was sort of the second internet, the first internet being the commerce internet, the dot-com, that sort of stuff, the second internet being the cloud computing, and the third internet being this decentralized blockchain type of world. Now, what um, I guess what's the... What's the benefit for for somebody like myself, okay, just a normal human being who uh, who has data, who uses data? How can I benefit from using Blue Zell, both either by being somebody who you know rents the space on my computer, and I'll ask you to elaborate a bit about that and tell the listeners, uh, and, and also somebody who you know may wish to access it in another area. Well, yeah, that, that that's a great question. I mean, you know, the 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 Web two point zero paradigm, as you mentioned, is where we currently are at in the world with the cloud, and you know, it it, it works really well. You've got companies like Amazon and and Microsoft that have cloud data centers, and they own those servers, and your data seems relatively safe there. But as you can see, with you know privacy laws coming through with GDPR, and you know leaks such as the ones we've heard about in the past year or so, there's some serious problems with the cloud. So what we've been doing with Web 3.0 is is what I consider the next generation. We call it fog computing or you know decentralized, which, which people have heard of more. And really, really what it comes down to is instead of having uh, servers that are run by major corporations, you have the server resources provided by the individual. And what that means is you know, instead of having a, a single server or a, cl- a bunch of servers run by by a large company, you you empower individuals, regular people that have computers sitting at home or at the office. They turn on their computer. Their computer runs some special software, and now their computer becomes one of possibly thousands or even millions of nodes that collaboratively provide the same services that those cloud computers used to provide. But now you've eliminated many different points of weakness 
And, you know, you've, you basically increased four different areas. Uh, I look at four metrics, security, uh, performance, reliability, and scalability. These are the four areas that most decentralized technologies and a lot of blockchains provide as value that I think that any person should, uh, you know, take very seriously. Yeah. Okay. And, and if I am to, so what do I want, what, what I want to understand is, right. I, I've got um, several computers here in, in my office. I'm, I'm a trader. So, you know, I've got to have backups for backups. I've got, I'm, I've got uh, radiation probably pouring out of these screens for like a mad dog, but uh, it, is, it, is what it, it is what it is for me to be a trader. Um, if I have space on my computer, for example, and I, I decide to plug into the Blues Network, is that going to slow down my operating? Is it going to be detrimental to my day-to-day, or is it just going to use the spare space? H- how does that work? Because one of the hurdles that i got to get around is, okay, if I was to be on this network, if I, if I was to um, be sort of renting out my space, uh, my data space, whatever, however you want to put that, will that slow anything down or, or do you choose how much you use? How does that work? How do you make me feel happy that I'm not going to slow my life down by being a part of the network? You know, that, that's a great question. And, and frankly, there's different answers to that depending on what kind of decentralized tech you're using. In, in general, uh, you really have to look at what you're using your machine for. If you're, you know, running a Bitcoin miner or an Ethereum miner on your machine, um, let, let's analyze that. What is your machine actually doing? Well, it's running a piece of software that's trying to mine blocks from the network. It's taking quite a bit of space. That's actually one of the challenges of blockchain. And I can talk about that with you, you know, later if that comes up. But it, it's a major problem because, you know, you end up filling up your hard drive and you, you end up with all your CPU being used quite a bit. Uh, I don't really think that running a Bitcoin miner or Ethereum miner really uses up your network very much in the long run. But, you know, the, the other two issues, you will notice slowdowns. Uh, when your hard drive starts to get full, most operating systems will slow down. If you're running a miner, it's going to take a lot of CPU. It will slow your machine down. So no doubt there's going to be something you'll notice. One of the things about Bluezell's database, which makes it unique, is we're not really heavily using your CPU. It's not a CPU intensive task. It's quite lightweight. Also, in terms of disk space, you get to decide how much space gets used. And frankly, it's not a lot of space. Uh, Bluezell is not a blockchain. It uses blockchain-like technology. But because it's not a blockchain, it benefits from the fact that it's not taking up nearly as much space as it as would be taken if you were running a Bitcoin mining node. So, um, you know, the impact on your machine, if you're participating as a farmer, and that's the term we use in Bluezell, if okay. you're back yeah. the node, is quite low. Um, it's not zero, but in my opinion, it's low enough that it's not significant. It's nothing that would have a heavy impact. Um, you know, the flip side is, you know, a lot of people leave their machines running. They, they have them running when they're at work. They'll have them at home, running at home. Their computers are idling. That's, a, that's an opportunity you have. That's something that you can take advantage of where instead of just having that computer running and, uh, you know, using up electricity unnecessarily, you can monetize that to some extent by becoming a farmer node. Okay, and and is the currency of Blue Zell the Blue Zell token? That's right. It's the Blue Zell token. It's what we launched in uh, mid April, or sorry, mid mid January. Okay, no, that, I think you've answered the question quite well. I mean, I, I'm not mining from these computers. The, these computers that I have here are, are for business. They're for trading. They're for running my business. There's no mining going on. Uh, if I have mining rigs, I'll, I'll buy mining rigs elsewhere. It's so in that respect, I can decide how much I'm going to use. Is there any tools for optimizing that so I can work out how much I can use without it slowing things? down or is that sort of just up to me um you know what right now it's a bit early in the game i mean um, i think that eventually you know bluezell's building up to have an ecosystem where there will be tools to answer this question i mean if you look at for example mining right now which is a much more developed ecosystem you can go to these websites that will you know basically tell you which bit uh, which cryptocurrencies to mine what are the best resources to have they even talk about the cost of electricity and they can help you determine you know, the return on your uh, investment. In the same vein, there will be um, there will be offerings of services like that to help you determine what's the best way to approach with Luzelle. But again, we're not we're not, you know, doing things like proof of work, which are very CPU intensive. It's it's a much more lightweight approach to the use of your resources. So I really like it because it's low impact. It still provides you with a great financial incentivization to participate, but you don't have to worry so much about the impact it's going to have on your machine. And, you know, in an ideal world, you can use the, you know, you can use your machine for your regular day to day, and you can use our software at the same time and and notice little or no impact. 
So what's your um, – I mean, look, I love the idea. I, I want to know what your end goal is. I mean, everyone's got you – know, a lot of the time when I speak to guests, I'll ask them, what's a win for you? Like, at what point do you get to the stage where you go, oh, we did it? We've, we have done it. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to continue to develop and grow and, you know, adapt and, and create new things. But at what point are you at, and your team going to sort of feel like we've achieved what we set out to achieve? Like, what does that look like for Bluzel um, and, and your objective? Like, what, is a, what does a win look like is what I'm getting at? What's your end goal? Well, you know, um, if, you, if you look at the Web 2.0 world and if I were to ask you as a developer – what is the database of choice? You know, there might be a few answers, maybe Oracle or MySQL uh, or SQL Server or MongoDB. In the database and the decentralized world, there is no de facto database right now. Uh, our real goal initially, a short-term goal, is to be the de facto database for the decentralized world. So if you're building a dApp, whether it's on Ethereum or Neo, or you're building a decentralized app that uses Bitcoin, Bluezell should be the database that you go to. There should be no questions about it. That's the de facto standard. We're aiming ourselves to be that that database. So, you know, when when companies are talking about database or building a software and they need to discuss what's that database layer, we want to be that obvious answer. And, um, you know, it, it's still early in the game. You know, there's, there's different players, even for file storage, for example. There's different players for CPU. There's different players even for which blockchain to use. So um, we're positioning ourselves to be the player in the database field. And, uh, you know, more longer term goal is beyond just decentralization. I mean, you know, I look at Bluezell as a better database, not just for dApps, but also for the, you know, the Web 2.0 world, the world of enterprises that, you know, have accounting software, have payroll, have uh, video games, have entertainment, any of those spaces, they're currently using databases. Bluezell is a better database. and I. I see that our secondary longer term goal is that we have a disruptive role in the Web 2.0 space such that those databases are now being uh, pushed aside for hours. Yeah, okay. So lofty goals as everyone in the space has and uh, and so we should. I mean, look, there's so much we can achieve here. We're still at the early days and the technology is really ramping and it's it's extraordinarily exciting. You mentioned um, it's open source, okay? So of course there's going to be community involved. It, do you want to tell us a little bit about what the community is doing, how they're getting involved, what you need to see more of, if you need help in any areas? Like, if you could explain that community that Bluezell has, I'd really appreciate that just to get a better understanding for it. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I have benefited personally from the open source and free software movement. Uh, you know, I started working with Linux and open source software in the 90s, so I'm a big fan of it. And that's that's basically a spirit I brought to the company our uh, Bluezell database is licensed under a GPL v3, which is a free software license. And when I say free, I talk about freedom. So really what it means is, you know, you can take the Bluezell code, you can fork the code, you can make changes to it. But uh, if, you, uh, if you're if you offering the same code back, you know, offering the service back to the public, you're required to put your code back into the community. You have to share all your changes back. So that's a fantastic ecosystem that I really believe in because it fosters uh, improvements from the community, but it also gives the responsibility that if you're benefiting off of the uh, shoulders of previous developers who contributed to the open source community, you, you need to contribute back. And so that, that's why we took this license up. Uh, one of our uh, advisors is actually Brian Fox, who was one of the earlier uh, members of the Free Software Foundation that's really spearheading free software and open source. So, you know, in terms of community, it's really important for Buzel that, you know, our team is not just Buzel employees, but also members of the open source community that that contribute. And what I mean by this is, is there's several different ways. You know, we our software is visible to the public on GitHub. We encourage uh, people to look at our code, download it, build it. If they see there's bugs, for them to report bugs, maybe even fix the bugs and submit those as requests that we can approve. One of the other areas is just the ecosystem of building extensions and modules. For example, you know, we, we want support in Bluezell so that developers from, say, C Sharp or PHP or Python, Ruby, they can all use our database without any difficulty. And in order for that to happen, extensions have to be built, and that's quite a bit of an effort. Uh, you know, we've already in the last, you know, month and a half had several contributions coming in from the public for support for all these languages. And, you know, that's something we really are excited about and we encourage. 
And uh, we also want to put bounties out to encourage open source developers to contribute. So uh, I think that the open source is a really important ingredient for Bluezell to proceed and be successful. And, you know, we're definitely doing our part to encourage it. Well, you, you mentioned the last month or so, and I, that was my next point really to get into, because I know that um, you, in through the month of May, you were sort of testing everything out and, and going to your community and whatnot. And I think you've got uh, your, I think you've, got, you've done that Lovelace um, launch at the end of June. Is everything still on target? Is it all still going uh, to according to plan? I'm not suggesting that anything's gone wrong. I'm just, you know, things, you learn things, especially when you put it out to the public and uh, you get feedback and you see what's going on. Are you, uh, are you still on schedule for the June or end of June uh, release? Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're on track. I mean, we obviously have an ambitious project and, uh, you know, it keeps us on our toes, but we're definitely, you know, on schedule to have our product out. And, uh, you know, we, we might even have some, uh, you know, like I said, some open source uh, developed products come out with it, for example. So I don't want to make any promises at this point, but definitely whatever we've talked about is coming. And, uh, you know, Indeed, you know, we are an agile team as we notice and learn things from the community based on needs and requirements, things can change. So, you know, there's always a possibility with a roadmap that we might reprioritize and move things around and possibly introduce new features based on demand. And and that's just a, a requirement if you're any kind of company that, you know, is highly public and, you know, has a large developer community. Now, you mentioned that there might be something coming out around the release study. Are you able to elaborate anything at all there for us? Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, we, we, you know, right now we have JavaScript support where we're, we've already promised uh, Solidity support from Ethereum and Neo support so that if you're writing smart contracts in either one of those environments, you can use our database. Uh, we're, we're expecting to be able to provide support for at least one other programming language beyond the ones we've promised already to come in sync with our June end release. We just haven't really clearly stated which one that is, and that's something we want to leave as a bit of a surprise. Okay, so that's your little that's your little uh, trick up your sleeve for the end of June likely release date, something along those lines, yeah, without saying too much more, correct? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, that's good, that's good. We, we like to get a scoop here. We like to give the listeners a little bit more information. Of course, a lot of listeners here, I am a trader, I am an investor, and uh, I talk to projects from a perspective of the business side of things. I want to, first of all, understand the business, and then I want to understand why I should be investing. Uh, and it, it does help by having these conversations. And a lot of the people that are listening right now will be sitting here listening going, does that make sense? Should I buy some? That is literally a lot of the conversations that are, that are being had within the different communities that I've set up and that we have running. So it's uh, it's good to know a little bit more about it and also uh, some of the little uh, carrots that get dangled ahead, they, they tend to do quite well. So um, Raj, one more thing. Um, I ask each of my guests, okay, I ask each of my guests uh, the different we, we compare the internet or get the internet compared a lot to blockchain and this new space okay you know 1993 is not when the internet was born but it was when it started to sort of get implemented used and do you know a fair bit of commerce was starting to go on in 2000 you know the wheels fell off a little bit things got a little bit hectic um great companies still come through of course and we have what we've got today as far as the internet's ecosystem whereabouts do you think we are 1993 2000 in that space um, between those years for blockchain at the moment? What do you think? You know, that, that's a great question. You know, I, I just came back from from uh, New York. I went to three wonderful conferences. And, you know, I, I'm just going to state it like it is. There, there's quite a bit of noise right now. Um, there's a lot of companies that are talking about wonderful things. There's a lot of token sales. There's a lot of smart people talking. And th there's a lot of stuff going on. So it, it's really difficult to kind of gauge you know, which are the real projects, which ones are the ones going to be left standing after a correction and which ones are not. Um, I was around in uh, 2000, 1999. I was in Silicon Valley. I, I got to experience some of the craze around the dot coms that was happening at the time. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on it, but, you know, it feels a bit to me like something like 1999, 2000, which, you know, is not the rosiest picture considering, you know, what happened in 2001. Uh, but I, I think like any kind of disruptive uh, technology or even bubble, um, you know, that correction is necessary for things to just sober up and settle down and, and for maturity to come into play. And I think that that's something that's going to happen. Is it going to happen on the same schedule that we experienced in the early 21st century? I can't, I don't know. 
So, because the, the, there seems to be two things. Like there's there's the hype, right? So there's a lot of hype that comes and goes in, around this space. We know that we saw it at the end of last year. And then there's the technology. It appears that the hype's ahead of the technology. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I being a scientist, when I meet any kind of people at any kind of event who are talking about what they're doing, the hype is, you know, making the claims that I just split the atom or, you know, I created the most amazing consensus algorithm that solves every problem that blockchains have. Uh, but then, you know, when you start getting into the questions about, well, how do you actually achieve it? What's the magic sauce? That's when I often run into a, a, a brick wall where I don't get answers. And either, you know, there is some sort of trade secrets or the guys just haven't really figured that out and they're just <laughs> making claims. And my concern is the latter, that those claims are being made, but they're not justified. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel that there's a lot of that going on right now. And, um, you know, it's just going to be a matter of time, really, when uh, we kind of know what, you know, what's real and what's not. That's it. Well, the rubber's got to hit the road at some point coming up very soon. But, Naraj, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show, mate. I, I, I do understand what you're trying to achieve. I wish you the best of luck. It sounds like you've, uh, you're have you coming from a very grounded place with a brilliant idea, and um, I, I, I hope to see the launch in June go exceptionally well. And, um, look, one thing I want to ask for the viewers or listeners, I should say, is where can they find out more information about the project? You know, the best place to go as as uh, decentralized as we are is bluzel.com. It's our webpage. It's um, a fantastic resource. There's also our blog, which you can link to from bluzel.com, which would uh, take you to um, our, something called the Blueprint, which has a list of all the uh, blogs that Bluzel has put out. You know, we have a very active community of people in the community company that are putting out blogs about various topics. Some of them are related to the database. Some of them are more decentralized in general in nature. So I definitely encourage people to check out both resources. We also have a very active uh, community uh, schedule where, you know, myself and other members of the team go to conferences. We go to meetups. We do presentations. We also have hosted two hackathons. So I think it's an excellent uh, opportunity for members of the public, if they want to be involved or connected, to look at that schedule and if it's possible for them to be able to uh, attend these events either in person or virtually. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Get out there, find more information. If, you, uh, if you're sniffing around events, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you look for Blizzell as a project to go and have a chat with Naraj and his team. Big things coming out of this space, big things for Blizzell at the end of June. You heard it here first on the TraderCobb Crypto Show, brought to you by TraderCobb.com. Jump across to the website and register there. Thank you so much, Naraj, for being on the show. I really appreciate your time, and I wish you all the best going forward. Thank you, Craig. It was a pleasure. The Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast. Check out TraderCobb.com because experience matters. 